Привет, comrades! Welcome to another one of my TNO mini series, and in this one, we're going to be unifying Russia. And I am aware that it is such an original idea. I know, guys. Um, but we'll be playing as Magadan and get Russia back on its feet and push the Germans out of our rightful land. I'm sorry that I haven't been able to upload any Hoi content in some time because I've been taking a break from the game and I've got school stuff to do. So I hope you guys understand. But that's enough. Let's let's get into the gameplay. Now, unfortunately, like every other warlord in Russia, we are not in the best state right now. We don't even have an economy. Our poverty rate is uh, between 50 to 80 uh, percent. We are basically backwards in every single way. So we're going to be fixing that as Magadan under Mikhail Metkovsky. So let's just start with our focus tree, the true heir of Harbin. The Russian fascist party, as it was known in Harbin, is now gone. Long displeased with Rodzevsky's policies and, rhetor and rhetoric, Merkovsky and his wing of the party has taken control of Magadan and are now molding it to suit their purposes. Before Merkovsky can do his duty for his motherland, however, he must rule alone, without constraint and free of disloyalty. While he trusts his wing of the party, he must crush dissent among the ranks, all those suspected of loyalty to Rodzewski shall find themselves purged. Oh, that's always a good sign. The last of the Jew. Makovsky steadied his glasses against his nose, peering down at a piece of paper with rows and rows of names written all over it. A list of Rodzewski's suspected loyalists. He looked up to discover a room packed to the brim with books from his white army days. Two gruff men, dressed in the party uniform, entered the room. In his small and messy room, they stood out as an oddity. Almost barbaric, even. Well, with a trembling voice, they gave him the names of the people they had purged today. Mikovsky gave them a, gener a generous smile. Thank you, you may go. When he heard the door knob latch itself close, he turned back to the list. Sergei A, Bruno B, Nicholas C. He crossed them out, dabbing the names in thick black ink, snuffing them out forever from the history of the Russian fascist party. Balancing his glasses of whiskey in his hands, Magovsky looked at his reflection against the murky liquid before taking a sip. It was night time by the time he finished the list. He gently pushed the men out, thanking them for a job well done. After they left, he bolted the door behind them, turning to his gramophone. He decided that he would dance to the memories of Harbin. He turned it on and let the good times roll. The boss has a lot of work to do. Now, fortunately, we are too far for the Luftwaffe to bomb us because all of these poor souls are in reach of the Germans and their colonies, like arms here being terror bombed. Look at all of those debuffs. Luckily, we don't have them. However, um, we have no infrastructure, as you can see. Um, actually, looking at all of Russia, nobody has any infrastructure. Nobody is doing any good. As a warlord in Russia, we have to... Uh, basically just raid all of our neighbors for arms and stuff, but um, there's practically nothing up here in the north, so we kind of only got like three people that we can attack and extract loot from, which isn't ideal, but at least we, can we should only be able to focus on this front over here and not overextend ourselves with all of these three guys up here. We've also got decisions to improve our state over here by investing into our army, our infrastructure, our industry, blah blah blah. But in order to do that, but in order to do that, we need, um, well, political powers. And we don't really have political power right now. We can also build schools, research facilities, blah blah blah, by using loot, and we get loot from raiding. Yeah, pretty simple stuff. We can also scavenge for loot, but this will only give us one. Now we're just going to be doing a few of these focuses and get all the way down to desperate times. And basically these focuses are to just um, improve our state over here overall. So we'll be improving our infrastructure, getting more civilian factories, improving our agriculture, societal development, and giving one of our generals a trait, which is always nice. Looks like our army was too fearsome for them to fight us, and they've paid us their tribute. Threats are sometimes needed to survive in the anarchy of Russia. 
that's right and we get political power and extra loot so we will have three loots after these 16 days and i've got my eyes set on you guys now i've also just realized that we've got a a, a, a big problem with uh with our equipment we're missing 586 infantry equipment and all of those artillery stuff and support equipment oh this is gonna be this is gonna be bad okay um adolf you've named this guy your successor and this could actually be a problem let's just hope he doesn't win the civil war night terrors the stench of sweat the fear of degenerates incapable of standing up for themselves another early morning break-in Another communist spy in, Harbin in the Harbin community seized from, this, from his king. The Japanese paid good money for life de detainees. The men of the RFP didn't care for what their masters wanted for the prisoners for, only that the, gun that the money was good. Every disappeared Bolshevik trash meant more guns, more weapons, everything for the national revolution. Pitlin's uniform was crisp, proper. He savored the occasion, the moment, the instant where hope of escape died in each prisoner's eyes. Some resisted until their turnover to the Japanese, but most of the rest eventually gave in. Empty eyes for human shells. Afraid covering their lives in Pitlin's hands, it felt good to be Rodzowski's point man. He was judge, he was arbiter. He would find all that disobeyed the Russian fa- No! He awoke, drenched in sweat. He had. He had never gone, helped in kidnappings, only heard rumors, only, heart beating, memories of Harbin, fading and vivid into, in his mind. He had known the RFP's worst thugs. Pet, Pitlin had known what they were up to. He had done nothing, mainly out of apathy. He had believed, back then, thought the Vols could do no wrong. Pitlin knew he shared in the guilt. He stood, shook his head. Perhaps he could not atone, yet he had to try. A past only half buried. An American visit. People do not usually come to visit Russia from the outside, especially Americans. After all, no one likes visiting war-torn wastelands, especially the spread out and frigid Far East. He probably won't even last a week without freezing to death unless he, unless we help him somehow. Perhaps Medkovsky could even meet with him. Being an American, he could be useful for reaching the leadership of the US. We have always wanted a closer relationship with the Americans, so why not start now, when we have one right here? Mikovsky even believes he has connections to the CIA. What fortune! Besides, it was a good way to show hospitality. Send him to Mikovsky and find the best vodka we have. I had a meeting with Magadan's boss today, Mikhail Mikovsky. He seemed pretty fun and offered me some um, almost not awful vodka. But overall, the experience was rather strange. He kept asking me about my connections to the President Nixon and the CIA, weirdly enough. Maybe it's my hair? After I told him I was just an average American, he seemed a bit disappointed. Then he asked about how life was in America and what I was doing in Russia. I told him I was a university student back home and I had come to visit so I could explore Russia and maybe have a, bit, have a little bit of fun and adventure instead of my boring life back at home. After our meeting, he gifted me this enormous bear skin. I guess I should wear it? I already think I'm fine without it, as I have my own fur coat, but I accepted it anyway. It was very warm. Next, I'll be heading up to Yakutsk to see what is going on there. At least he had fun? Huh, it seems that our warlord friend over here has refused to pay their tribute. So be it. The guns of gunfire continue to resonate in Russia. Inspection Day. Mikhail Metkovsky, the Vos himself, made his way down the Magadan garrison to inspect the quality of troops that made up his army. As he and his high command approached the troops in formation, all of the soldiers were dressed as he was and sported their weapons of war. But even before he approached the Metkovsky could tell what poor soldiers they would make. His generals exchanged nervous glances with, with, one, with one another. One soldier was too fat, the other malnourished, the third one too short, and the fourth didn't have his uniform button done upright. They all had the full uniform, but it seemed as if they had simply borrowed bits from and pieces from their peers, as a lot of them didn't fit. All of them, not just these four, were equipped with weapons that looked like they had been outdated by the time the Germans were ravaging the westward of Russia. 
The inspection ended, Mikowski politely walking along the columns of, Mag- of the Megadon garrison, taking mental notes, scruffy beards, o- outdated weapons, ill-discipline. Mikowski knew that it wasn't their fault, for the most part. He had a chronic shortage of bodies, weapons, and officers, all of which were necessary for raising and maintaining a professional army. After the inspection, he had called a meeting of his high command where a rare flare of anger shone through his usual professional behavior. What's going on? Are these the best troops that you can offer me? I don't want to hear it. If those are the men who guard the capital, what do those on the front lines look like? How do you think we will overcome Radvorsky? Rodzewski, oh my god, I, I can't with these names, I'm sorry guys. Let alone retake the entirety of Russia. I don't care what the solution is. I want you to find it. And I want it to be briefed on it this time tomorrow. Oh, come on, it's not that bad. Now we can um, do our foreign policy, I assume. We have three options that we can go to. The Tsar, residing in Chita, is our unwilling enemy at best. But perhaps we can convince his clique to accept a ceasefire. The Americans under their President Nixon may be inclined to support us provided we make them promises of freedom and reform. Finally, the Russian immigrants, the most prominent of whom is the influential fascist Anatasy von Sesky, oh, I'm, I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong, might be persuaded through their resources behind our cause. That is not good. No, th- this peace in the Middle East, there's not gonna be a peace in the Middle East after this. That's not good at all. Alright, let's start with the Tsar and then the Vols and finally the President because going this route first will give us equipment which is important for us to because we have to train an army and we have no equipment right now so we kind of need this and then I want to see what this will do and the, of course the Americans the dockyards and the things we get they can wait wait a second um, we have a few decisions for us to improve our relations with Americas and we've got a year to get American support, so I'm gonna do this branch of the focus tree second, I guess, because I want to actually like get our American support to high. The Treaty of Cooperation. Here's the treaty that the Tsarist sent Petlin said, placing the draft of the agreement on the table. Petlin, he said, chilling every bone in the minister's body. He go. It was the moment of truth where the divorce would deliver his final verdict. Good work, Velkovsky said after a few moments. You exceeded my personal expectations. Before I signed this, he picked up his pen, toying with it. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Pitlin drew a deep breath. No, he said. There is none. Velkovsky's hand promptly drew a signature on the document. It is done. He dropped the pen and nose. Deliver this to the representative of the Tsarist and tell him that the boss accepts this deal and the death to, and death to Rozevsky. I appreciate that I have at least one competent person in charge of affairs around here. A smile, a rare thing for Metkovsky to show. Got a non-aggression pact with the Transbaikal Principality, aka Cheetah. He remembered the first word Metkovsky told him. Convince the man in the White House. That is all. Metkovsky did not like being taken like me. At the best of times, Pitling could see the old Harbin spirit in him. A spirit of hope, of kindling, of a prayer for a new home. On top of the further stack, a layer folder, bound in manila yellow. Plastered to the front of it was labeled that read, The Siberian Bill of Rights. The document contained Petlin's personal ideas to solid more aid or at least sympathy from Americans. He wondered if Mikowski knew what his real sympathies were. He shook his head. Now was not the time for the mind to wander. He laid his fingers upon the keys of the typewriter and the clacking began. Let's hope this works. The Siberian Bill of Rights This is far too liberal, Pitlin, Mankowski said, holding back his anger. It seems almost socialist to me. He put the set of files down and pressed his index fingers against it. This is not acceptable. It was inconceivable that you would present this to me in the first place. How could he do this? Pitlin, the man he considered to be almost a brother to himself, his own foreign minister, this is not what I, not we stand for. When I read your document, I found phrases like this, like the right to assembly, right to free speech. These are all dangerous ideas, not fit for Russia. Their rebellious intent practically jumps off the pages, Metkovsky sighed. Just what the hell were you thinking, brother? Pitlin gathered himself and stood straighter. 
Sir, if I may insist, my ideas can still be useful, not only in convincing the Americans, but the Russians as well. I have faith in the strength of our ideals and convictions, sir. I beg you not to mistake my incompetence as rebelliousness. I would never. You have been with us since the beginning, closer to me than even my chancellor, he whispered to Pitlin. Now help me with all these. I am afraid that your brother lacks the skill necessary to convince the Americans. Y yes, Pitlin said. Good. Now cut back. We can't afford all of this. Make holes and loop them. Dismissed. Sacrifices have to be made. Why is it with foreign minister being the uber reformist? The same thing happened in Spears, Germany, where Helmut Schmidt was like the ultra reformist that wants to restore democracy to Germany. Like, why is it always the foreign minister? Okay, we are now done with our American foreign policy tree. Now it's time to focus on whatever this is over here. You know, I'm really liking these free guns I'm getting from the Americans, from Cheetah, from basically anywhere. Metkovsky blinked. There was no mistaking it. The figure was Verbell, looking more green than in the photographs Metkovsky had seen of him. When he came face to face with Verbell, the man tried to give a clumsy smile only for it to be mistaken for contempt. Welcome, Metkovsky said in English. We have been expecting you, Mr. Verbell. Privet, Mirvobel said, my tovarish. He continued in Russian, mixing it with English words when he had no clue which words to use. Peskovsky, for his part, tried to dissuade him from bastardizing the Russian language, and occasionally a word or two made it through Verbel's manners. But he was inconsolable. What little correct Russian he spoke was sprinkled with the generous helpings of fucking and shit blushing furiously in anger and embarrassment, to a start of a beautiful friendship. Verbell claps his hand with neither doubt nor comprehension. Da, tovarish. Now, it's time to get our army back to shape and get ready to reunite Russia. And we'll not be going down the mercenary force, because we are not going to do a Verbell playthrough. Uh, we are also not going to do the US tree, because I think the, the Russian tree is best for us because of all these buffs. Alright, we are now finally ready to unite the party in the Far East. Turn back. The front lines are over there. The mercenary said nothing and shot at Boris. It hit and Boris was thrown off his feet. Ivan fired back, nailing the mercenary in the shoulder. All over the lines, incidents like this flared up and the operation was called off in a panic. Verblot's coup had begun. The mercenary services are no longer required. And I'm guessing Verbal got shot or he just left. Okay, we've got a new bench of focus tree and I'm just gonna quickly rush down here and declare war on armor. Alright, now it's time for our reclamation of the Far East. So I'm just gonna um, uh, speed up the video from now on and invade uh, what we can. Pizarre. Speak your mind, Makowski said, the dinner part practically over at his point. Your majesty. I realize that my position in Russia has grown rather tenuous. Mikhail gave him a chuckle. Not that it has been well in the first place, but there you go. So, what will happen to me now? Makowski stared at him, deliberating this czar was a potential danger. Mikhail could be a dangerous contender for power. On the other hand, the monarchist strain in the RFP was wearing away and fast. 
Soon, no one would take Mikhail's calm claim seriously, and letting him go into exile far away from Russia might be the prudent and decent decision. Raskovsky opened his mouth to speak. Okay, uh, the false czar's fate will be decided by a wheel. So, spin, let's go. Okay, um, the wheel has decided that Mikhail stay in Russia. I'm sorry, Mikhail, but the wheel speaks. You will stay here. There we go, we have won in the, the far east of Russia and we can now integrate all of their territories and finally form the Siberian National Republic. But um, I'm pretty sure if I form this right now I will get a new focus tree and all of these focuses will be gone. So I'm gonna just do all of these focuses first but not in this video because I think this video has gone on for long enough and oh, it's it's getting late right now so I'm getting really 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 tired so I'm gonna just stop it here and continue in the next episode.